Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah Allahumma shahli sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqtatim min lisani yafqahu qawli Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I would like to welcome you all today to tonight's lecture uh, which has been entitled uh, Pearls of Wisdom from Ayatul Kursi from Ayatul Kursi uh, before we get into the subject matter, what I would like to do is shed some light on our relationship with the Qur'an. On our relationship with the Qur'an. And more specifically, our responsibility towards the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, He says, Inna هذا al-Qur'an yahdi lillati hiya أقوم إن هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوم that this Quran guides us and leads us to that which is most correct and what is most right. So the objective of the Quran is to guide us. ويبشر المؤمنين and to give glad tidings or to give us some type of inspiration. This is the objective of the Qur'an. And this objective will never be able to be met unless we fulfill our responsibility towards the Qur'an. So we understand the objective of the Qur'an is to inspire us, is to guide us, and we understand that this objective will never be able to be met unless we fulfill our responsibility towards the Qur'an. And when we speak about our responsibility towards the Qur'an, it is important that we keep in mind four things. How many things? Four things. And when we uphold these four commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then in turn, we as Muslims have fulfilled our responsibility towards the Qur'an. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to be amongst those who fulfill our responsibility to His word. The first level of responsibility is to recite the Qur'an. Now every individual must learn and understand how to recite the Qur'an. Why is learning how to recite the Qur'an so important? Can somebody tell me why it would be so important to learn? We have the MP3, we have YouTube, we have our CDs in our vehicle. If the Qur'an needs to be heard, it can be heard. But why is it our responsibility to learn how to properly recite the Qur'an? Anybody? Okay, I'm looking for something more specific. Why is it our responsibility to recite the Qur'an? It has something to do with the pillars of Islam. Salah. Because our recitation of the Qur'an is a pillar of our prayer, which is a pillar of our religion. Therefore, if we do not know how to recite the Qur'an, whether it be Surah Al-Fatiha or any other verse, then this may nullify our Salah, or decrease the reward in our salah. So to learn how to recite the Qur'an is essential for every Muslim. And that is on two angles. The first angle is learning the letters, the Arabic letters, so that you are able to read. And secondly, to be able to recite the Qur'an the way it should be recited with proper tajweed. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, He says, وَرَتِّلِ الْقُرْآنَ Tartila and recite the Quran the way the Quran was revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the way it deserves to be recited. So this is the first level of responsibility when it comes to our relationship with the Quran. The second level of responsibility is to understand what we are reading. The Quran was not just revealed to be recited. But the Qur'an was revealed to be understood, to be contemplated. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the, in the Qur'an, He says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنِ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Will the people not contemplate? Will they not sit there and reflect and understand the meanings and the verses of the Qur'an? Because if they don't, what is that a sign of? What is it a sign of? It is a sign that our hearts are sealed. So 
So when we take this level of sitting down with the Qur'an and understanding the Qur'an and, and understanding it in our life, right? The way that I may interpret or understand a verse, it may be more powerful to me than you. The way that I recite Al-Fatiha, we're reciting the same words, but why is it, my, why is it moving my heart? and it's not moving yours, or why is it moving your heart and it's not moving mine? All of that goes back to our understanding of the Qur'an. Some people, they just don't even listen to the Qur'an. And the excuse is, Wallahi, I don't understand it. Well then, take the initiative and begin to understand. It's not about understanding all of the Qur'an, but at least understanding the verses that you recite in your daily prayers. Understanding Surah Al-Fatiha, and this can go on, if we gave a lecture about Surah Al-Fatiha, it could go on for months, just showing you how deep Umm Al-Kitab, it is the mother of the Qur'an, and we recite it every day as if it is lip service. We don't understand what it means. What does Alhamdulillah mean? What does Rabbil Alameen mean? What does Ghayr Al-Maghdubi Alayhim Waladdaleen mean? We need to understand this in order for it to actually penetrate us and benefit us. So the first is what? Learning how to recite the Qur'an. The second is understanding the verses of Qur'an that we are reciting. Now number three is memorizing. Memorizing the Qur'an. Why is it important to memorize the Qur'an? Anybody want to give me the answer? Why is it important? Why, why is it so important for me to memorize the Qur'an? I have it on my phone. I can play it whenever I want. Shifa yawm al-qiyamah. MashaAllah. What does the Prophet Sallallahu say? That Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will raise the person levels and levels according to their recitation of the Qur'an. So this is a very good reason that we should memorize this because we will be reciting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. And as we recite to Allah, Allah will then raise us. Allah will then raise us levels because as we know, Jannah has levels. Jannah has levels and the highest level is Firdaus al-A'la. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be amongst those of Firdaus al-A'la. Anybody else? Why is memorizing the Qur'an so important? Salah, very good. Salah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and why is it all, it's so important to memorize? Because sometimes we're content with only the four or five surahs that we have memorized. And we recite them in every prayer of our lives. And we recite them, and we recite, and then they just get exhausted. Nothing new, nothing fresh, nothing to move your heart because we're just recycling it. Over and over and over. So the more Qur'an that you memorize, the more you implement in your salah, the more your salah becomes stronger. The more you connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But one of the reasons that I wanted to mention about the importance of memorization of the Qur'an, and that is through preserving the Qur'an. That when we memorize the Qur'an, what we are actually doing is we are preserving the Qur'an the way it was revealed to Muhammad over 1400 years ago. We are preserving it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, He says, That we are the ones who have revealed the Qur'an and we are the ones who will preserve the Qur'an. And that preservation of the Qur'an is done through you, is done through you, is done through every single one of us. Right? You can take these books behind me and you can burn them. You can take every type of literature in the world and you can burn it. The only writing, the only word that can come back letter for letter is the Qur'an. Because we have people like this young man who are coming here every single day and memorizing the Qur'an. Because they are preserving it. In the Qur'an mahfuf fi sudur wa fi sutur. It is preserved in the hearts of the people and in the lines of the Mus'haf. And in the lines of the Mus'haf. Number, what number? Four. Ahsantum, you guys are paying attention. Number four 
is action. Is action. Because the whole purpose of the Qur'an is to be brought into manifestation. It is a book of action. So when we read and we understand and then we memorize, it is only incumbent and it is only our responsibility that we act upon these verses of the Qur'an. People are depressed. People are sad. So when they recite the word of Allah, فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَىٰ إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَىٰ he realizes or she realizes that yes, I will be able to get through this calamity. You are bringing that Qur'an into manifestation. You are applying it in your life. And this is the way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. When Aisha radiallahu anha was asked, what was the character of the Prophet? She didn't sit there and give a lecture. The Prophet ﷺ was this, the Prophet ﷺ was that, he was this, he was that. She said it very short and sweet, radiallahu anha, where she said, Kana khuluquhu al Quran. That his manner was the Quran. That he brought the Quran into life. And, and his words, and his actions, and the things that he did, and the things that he didn't do, the Prophet ﷺ brought it into manifestation. So who can uh, uh, give me a quick uh, review of the four levels of responsibility that we have with the Qur'an? Anybody can quickly remind the group here about these levels. Go ahead, Ahmed. Recitation. recitation. Very good. To learn how to recite the Qur'an accordingly. Good. Number two. Understanding. Uh, understanding, very good. To understand and to contemplate the Qur'an. Number three, memorizing. And there's a reason uh, why they have said understanding before memorization. Why? Anybody? Easier. It's easier. Very good. It's easier. It is easier for somebody to memorize the Qur'an when he actually understands what he is memorizing. It's not just a bunch of gibberish. The individual knows actually that there's meaning and there's weight and there's guidance in these words. So the more that we understand the Qur'an, the more it is easier for us to memorize the Qur'an. And last but not least, can somebody remind us please? Action. Action, action right? Because the Qur'an is a book of action. Ahsantum. Jazakumullahu khairan. So now we understand our responsibility towards the Qur'an. We understand our responsibility towards the Qur'an. And it takes steps. Somebody who comes new into the religion, it's very difficult for them to do all of the things at once. They should focus their, their time mainly on their learning of the recitation. How to recite the Fatiha. How to learn a few chapters of the Qur'an. The smaller ones that you can find towards the end of the Qur'an. And then move forward, and then move forward, and then move forward. This is the methodology of the companions radiallahu anhum. Where the companions, they would not exceed 10 verses of the Qur'an until they did what? They recited it properly, until they understood it, until they memorized it, and until they applied it. So this is the proper methodology, and this is the way that we treat the Qur'an, and we uphold our responsibility to the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tayyib, let's move forward inshallah ta'ala, and get into the portion of the Qur'an that we will be discussing today. The portion of the Qur'an that we will be discussing today. And the verse, it is one verse, it is one verse, and this is the verse of Ayatul Kursi. It is Ayatul Kursi. Now the Qur'an consists of over 6,000 verses, 6,200 verses, over 6,200 verses. And in authentic narration, the Prophet Sallallahu is saying that from these 6,000 verses and above, that there is one verse that leads them all. There is one verse that is greater than them all. Not taking anything away from the greatness of the Qur'an, but this is the greatest of the great. And this is Ayatul Kursi. And it is located in which surah? Surah Al-Baqarah. Which is what number? Two. What verse? Number 255. Number 255. So if you would like, you can open up your phone. And I know many of you 
have, uh, you know, a mushaf on your phone, go to the verse and have it sitting in front of you while we are speaking about this. It'll be a lot uh, more beneficial than just sitting there and trying to connect the verses. This is just advice you are free to do as you will. So that was chapter 2, verse 255, Ayatul Kursi. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam approached uh, his companion Ubay uh, bin Ka'ab and he asked him, Ya Aba al Mundir, Ayu ayati ma'ak min kitab illahi a'zam? Which verse of Quran that you have memorized with you is the greatest? And one thing we need to understand is Ubay bin Ka'ab uh, an, he was known to be very, very knowledgeable in his religion. He was very knowledgeable in his religion. But, and he knew the answer to this question, but he didn't answer. What did he say? Allahu wa rasuluhu a'lam. Why? Huh? Sense of pride. So min bab al-ihtiram. So as a sense of respect for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? Because the Prophet knows, and it is only uh, proper that you humble yourself to your teacher, that you humble yourself to your teacher. So, he asked him again, Ya Abin Mundir, which verse of the Qur'an with you is the greatest? And he realized that this time he wanted him to answer. So he said, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum. So Ubay bin Ka'ab, he says, فَضَرَبَ فِي صَدْرِي So he hit Ubay in the chest. Just like, yeah, my man. You know when you, you know, you give your friend a prayer, you, you got it, you my man, you got it, you're good, you're right. And then he congratulates him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala congratulate you on your knowledge. Ya Ubay. So we know from this hadith, that indeed the greatest verse in the Qur'an is Ayatul Kursi. Is Ayatul Kursi. It is not only the greatest verse because of the subject matter, but it is the greatest verse because it offers the greatest huh, reward. It offers the greatest reward. What is the greatest reward? Jannah. Jannah? Huh? Jannah. That's the greatest reward. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Udkhul. And you enter. That is the greatest thing. That is the greatest moment. That is the greatest memory you will ever have. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to enter through the gates of Jannah. So, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said in an authentic hadith, مَنْ قَرَأَ آيَةِ الْكُرْسِ بَعْدَ كُلِّ صَلَاةٍ لَمْ يَمْنَعُهُ مِنْ دُخُولِ الْجَنَّةِ إِلَّا أَنْ يَمُوتِ That the individual who recites ayat al-kursi, huh? and we said there are the levels, didn't we? Right? The levels, with those proper levels, huh? to recite it properly. And to memorize it and to understand it and to apply it. Man qara'a ayatul kursi ba'da kulli salatin lam yamna'uhu dukhul al jannah illa an yamut. That nothing will uh, uh, prevent this individual from entering jannah till he dies. Death. So the only thing standing between you and jannah is what? Is death. Right? Showing you the weight and showing you the virtues of this verse. And if we haven't memorized Ayatul Kursi, it is a must. It is a must that we understand this. Why? Because it's not only implemented after our Salah. And we will get into that because this Adhkar, this is from the Adhkar that the Prophet would never leave. The Prophet would recite Ayatul Kursi every single day. Not only after his prayer, but when he woke up and in the evening as well. From the adhkar al sabah wal masa. So he would never leave it. And this ayah itself, it offers us a form of protection. It offers us a form of protection. We all want to be protected. 
people coming to me. Oh, you go everywhere. Insurance company here, insurance company there. A brother today, he came to me. He asked me about insurance. Can I be an insurance broker? I said, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al hayyul qayyum. I'm an insurance broker. I'm giving you this protection. لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض. So it's that protection that we need, and I share with you the story of Abu Huraira رضي الله عنه, where he narrates that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم gave him a responsibility, and that responsibility was during the month of Ramadan, and it was to protect all of the charity that they had received during the month of. Ramadan, as you know, people like to become very generous in the month of Ramadan. So there was excess charity. So he said, Ya Abu Huraira, you take care of this. This is your duty. At night, you're taking care of this. So he said, Sami'na wa ata'na ya Rasulullah. So he's sitting there, and he's sitting there, and as you know, we're all human. What happens? Radiallahu anhu, he falls asleep. Huh? He falls asleep. And then he suddenly wakes up in the middle of the night, and he sees somebody taking from the food stuff, taking from the charity. And he says, what are you doing? I'm going to take you immediately to the Prophet Sallallahu He said, please, I'm miskeen, and I have so many dependents, have mercy. He said, fine, I will let you go today. So when morning came, the Prophet Sallallahu came to Abu Huraira, and he said, what did you do with your guest last night? The Prophet knows, alayhi salatu wasalam. He said, I let him go because he said he was poor and he was weak and he had many dependents. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, he is a liar and he will come back. So he said, okay, he's coming back. He was anticipating this night. So the next night, he waits and he waits and he finds the same individual doing the exact same thing. He grabs him and says, I am taking you to the Prophet. What does he say? The exact same thing. I'm broke. I got nothing. Help a brother out. Khalas, I'll let you go this time. But this is the last time. I promise you. He said, Tayyib. So he lets him go. The next morning, what happens? Who comes? Alayhi salatu wassalam. Ya Abu Huraira, what did you do with your guest last night? He said, I, you know, with his head down, I let him go because he said he was in need and he needed help. He said, Tayyip, he's a liar and he will come back again. So he came the third night and lo and behold, once a stealer, always a stealer. He came in, he was trying to jack the place up, walk out, but Abu Huraira, he catches him. Khalas, I am not letting you go. You're coming with me. He said, no, 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 wait, please. He knows he can't use that on a miskeen card anymore, right? Right, you can't, you maybe once, maybe the third time you're not going to be able to use it. Right? So what does he say? He says, khalas. Either he takes me to the Prophet, and that's not going to be good, or I have to give something else up. So he gave it up. And he said, listen, listen, listen. I will give to you something that will benefit you if you do not take me to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, what is it? He said that if you recite Ayatul Kursi, so he has to weigh the pros and the... He's given up a lot, but he's not given up everything. If you recite Ayatul Kursi before you go to sleep every night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send to you an angel that will stand over your head and protect you from any harm. He said, ma. So he goes the next day, he keeps him until the morning. And then after the morning, he lets him go. That morning, who comes? Alayhi salatu wassalam and asks, what did you do with the guest that you had last night? And he starts narrating the story to the Prophet. He said that if I recite Ayatul Qursi before I go to sleep every night, that Allah, Allah, He's your, huh? He is the one taking care of you. We'll send an angel to protect me while I am sleeping. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, Sadaqaka wa huwa kathub. He has told the truth, but indeed he is a liar. He is still a liar. So we learn from this shaitan, he had to give it up. Alhamdulillah, we take from this. And that must hurt shaitan. When we recite, know that you're 
You know, you're giving a swift one to the shaitan because he had to give it up. So recite it. Before we go to sleep, recite it and make your adhkar before you go to sleep. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send that protection to protect us throughout the night. Tayyib. Let's get into the actual uh, verse of the uh, surah. Uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse Ayatul Kursi. We said that it is uh, number 255. <clears throat> Before we recite Quran, what do we recite? A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim. Now, what does A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim mean? Uh, it's important that we understand this. So to seek assistance, to seek protection from Allah, from who? Specifically, right? From shaitan. Now, there's two reasons why we must do this. Number one, so that we are not distracted. So we're not distracted in our recitation, right? Or so we're not caught off guard. Or so we're not doing something we shouldn't be doing while we are uh, reciting the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the shaitan, he does not like listening or hearing the Qur'an. It is like scolding him with hot water. It, it, it hurts him, it physically hurts him. And the second reason why we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the shaitan is in order for us to be protected in not understanding the Qur'an incorrectly. Because if you look at the ummah, there are many different groups and many different people who claim Islam. Look what's going on overseas. These individuals who claim to be Muslims and they're holding the Qur'an, the same Qur'an that we're holding, but the issue is not in their recitation, but their issue is in their understanding of the Qur'an. That is why we must seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from an evil and incorrect understanding of the Qur'an. And this is mainly influenced by the shaitan. And this is mainly influenced by the shaitan. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the verse verse, He says, بَعْدَ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ اللَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ الْحَيُّ الْقَيُّومِ So let's take some time with this. بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى This is the greatest verse of the Qur'an because it begins with the greatest statement that any man can ever make. And that is the statement of Tawheed. La ilaha illallah. So it's introducing itself to us with the, with the greatest word that you can say, that can come out of your mouth, that your lips can utter, is la ilaha illallah. Allahu la ilaha illahu. This is what we are saying. And this religion is based on Tawheed. So much so that the Prophet wasallam spent 13 years in Mecca teaching Allahu la ilaha illahu. This is what he was doing in Mecca for 13 years. You want to know what he was doing? He was teaching this. Allahu la ilaha illahu. That's it. Showing you the importance of this statement. And it is a statement that rejuvenates our faith. The Prophet wasallam would say to his companions, Jaddidu aymanukum. Rejuvenate your faith. They would say to the Prophet, How are we to rejuvenate our faith? He said, Akthiru min qawl, la ilaha illallah. Continuously and consistently keep your tongues wet of the statement, La ilaha illallah. Because if you are an individual who keeps his tongue or her tongue wet, with the statement of La ilaha illallah while you are living, then inshallah ta'ala, you will be amongst those individuals that when death comes, you will utter these words, La ilaha illallah. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows these words to be the last words that we utter. Musa alayhi salam. Musa, it is narrated by Jabir bin Abdullah. Musa, he turned to Allah and he said to Allah, Ya Allah! Give me an ad'iya, a, a, a supplication, or a dua that I can make to you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to him, قُلْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ And Musa replies to Allah saying, Ya Allah, 
Everybody is saying La ilaha illallah. That's simple dua, right? Because as you know, all prophets and all messengers, they came with the same message. And that message, that common denominator is La ilaha illallah. So he said, I want something new. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then explains to Musa, Ya Musa, if, Allah, if I were to put the seven heavens and the seven worlds and everything that inhabits, all the inhabitants of the seven heavens and the seven worlds on one side of the scale, and I were to take La ilaha illallah and what it means and what it implies on the other side of the scale, then it would outweigh everything in the heavens and everything on earth. Showing you the weight of this word, La ilaha illallah. There is no God, there is no deity that is worthy of worship except for Allah. Allah, Allahu la, that's the first word, Allah. What does Allah mean? Oh, <laughs> what does Allah mean? God? Who said God? Yes, I know you said it. What does God mean? What does Allah mean? Hmm. One, 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 one God, one God. Ah, go ahead. Explain that to me. Al Ilah. That is what Allah means. Al Ilah. The only God that is worthy of worship. Right? The only deity that is worthy of worship. And this is the primary name of Allah. We say Allah is, pri Allah is the primary name of Allah. And it is the most often used name in the Quran. The Quran begins with this name and it ends with this name. Bismillah. La, in the name of Allah, and then the last verse, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ مَلِكِ النَّاسِ إِلَهِ النَّاسِ Right? إِلَهِ النَّاسِ These are the two names. So the Quran, it begins with this name, and it ends with this name. And it is the primary name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is the primary name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it incorporates and it necessitates all other names. It incorporates and it necessitates all other names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, how many names does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have? Khata. More than 99 names, right? We know of 99 names, but we also know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has knowledge with Him, right? So there are more names that He has kept with Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, when we say that it necessitates and it uh, incorporates all other names and attributes, how? And if somebody can answer this question, <laughs> I will get them something real good. <laughs> That's what I say to the young guys. <laughs> I go to Max, I'm buying Slurpee. <laughs> but if you can tell me why this name necessitates and incorporates all other names, I would say, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. And it goes back to understanding what Allah actually means. Ah. La. Lissa jay, inshaAllah. La. La. Inna lillahi tis'atim wa tis'ina isma min min ahsaha dakhil al jannah. La. Good. All that. That's what. That's very close. That's very, very, very close. Khalas, I'll buy you half a slurpee, inshallah. <laughs> Go ahead. I got brothers. I like seeing this. I would rather spend my time seeing you brothers be engaged than having to be the only one speaking. Go ahead. This is what the ulama have used to make the delil. Because what, you, what name does he use? Lillah. Right? But here, we need to understand something. Ahsant. That we said that the name of Allah means Al-Ilah, which means the only deity worthy of worship. 
So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not Al-Alim, and if he is not Al-Kareem, and if he is not Al-Jawad, and if he is not Al-Rahman, then he is not deserving to be worshipped. Then he is not deserving to be worshipped. So now we're getting levels of understanding. Man huwa Allah. 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 Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he goes on to mention two other names. Al-Hay Al-Qayyum. Al-Hay Al-Qayyum. Al-Hay Al-Qayyum. Al-Hay is the ever-living. Meaning, somebody, oh, not somebody, let me rephrase that. An entity or, or the deity that has no beginning and has no end. It is perfect life. And this is different when we compare it to the creation. We were born, we all have a birth date, right? We all have a birth date, and we know when that birth date is, right? And we all have a date of expiration. We may not know what it is, but it is written. It is written, it's there, just as we are sure that we had a birthday, we are sure that there's a date of expiration, there's a day that we will pass away. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is nothing before Him and there is nothing after Him. And He is perfect in this attribute. And He is perfect in His living. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Hay. Al-Qayyum, the one who sustains and protects all that exists. Allah sustains and protects all that exists and upholds everything in His dominion. Al-Qayyum. This is the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now going back to what you mentioned, what did you mention about that? Al-Ism al-A'adham. Now some of the scholars have said that Allah has a great name. That if you call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by this name, then indeed He will answer your dua. He will answer your dua. And many of the scholars have agreed uh, not consensus, but they have agreed that al hayyul Qayyum are from these names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is much dua where the Prophet sallallahu uses this, where he says, Ya Hayyu, Ya Qayyum, bi rahmatika astaghith, aslih li sha'ni kullah, wa la tukilni ila nafsi tarfata'ayn. Oh Allah, Ya Hayyu, Ya Qayyum, the ever living, the one who sustains and protects all that exists. Aslih li shatni, take care of all my affairs and do not leave me in charge of my affairs for even a blink of an eye. Right? For even a blink of an eye. So these are the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how many names in this verse? No? Three. Three names Allah, Al Hay, and Al Qayyum. La ta'khuduhu sinatu wa la noam. Now, neither drowsiness overtakes him or sleep. Now, can we agree that to be drowsy is a weakness? Right? To sleep is a weakness. We sleep and we're drowsy because we're weak. We need to rest and we need to rejuvenate ourselves. Can we agree that not sleeping and not being drowsy is a weakness as well? It's called insomnia. Right? It's called insomnia. It's a disease where people, they can't sleep, they want to sleep, they need to sleep, but they can't sleep. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not that he can't sleep, and it's not that he doesn't want to sleep, but it's that he doesn't need to sleep, subhanahu. But he doesn't need to sleep, because he is perfect. Because he is perfect. And again, this goes back to making the difference between the creation and the Creator. When you look at this verse, what it is presenting us is that Allah is nothing like us. That is what this verse is telling us, that Allah is the Creator, and you are the creation, and we are different from the Creator. And we are different from the Creator. And it is only right that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't sleep, or is not become drowsy, because He is Al-Qayyum. He is Al-Qayyum. We said that Al-Qayyum is the one who sustains and protects all that exists. So how can you be a sustainer? Like for example, Abu Hurairah what happened? He took some Z's. Right? And what happened? Things got out of hand. 
So how can somebody, or how can something that controls something not be fully dedicated and devoted to that thing except that something may happen? So similarly, because Allah is al hayyu and because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al qayyum la ta'khuduhu sinatun wa la naum. La ta'khuduhu sinatun wa la naum. Lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi ard So this word ma, ma al mawsul ma, meaning everything. He didn't say, lahu man fi samawati wa man fi ard because if he said that, he would say to him belongs who? The individuals who are in the heavens and who are in the earth. But not just the individuals belong to Allah. Do we belong to Allah? Are you sure we belong to Allah? Yes. What's your evidence? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. That verily we belong to Allah and verily unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we shall return. But he's saying ma meaning everything. So we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner of absolutely anything. That money that you have in your bank <laughs> doesn't belong to you. Right? That car, that house, it doesn't belong to you. This was a gift or a loan from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In reality, it belongs to Him. And because it belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should understand something. This should be an encouragement to do what? If we know that Allah holds everything and, 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 and owns everything, what this should, should this encourage us to do? Not get attached. Not get attached? Okay, that's very good. Not get attached because Aslan, it doesn't even belong to you. Okay, to take care. It's because it's an amana. Very good. Anybody else? Very good, huh? Huh? To donate, right? The more you give, the more you get. But before all of that, you guys are missing one thing. Huh? Dua. Dua. Faqid al-shay la yu'ti. You ask Allah because He has a... Would it make sense to go to somebody who has nothing on the street and ask him, can I borrow five dollars? And He's the one asking people. Would that make sense? Absolutely not. We go to Allah and make dua and ask for our sustenance. Why? لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ It belongs to Allah. It belong, if it belongs, just ask. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعْي خلاص, ask him. He owns it. You don't have to go. And sometimes we say, oh my God, there's so many people I need to go through. There's so many issues. I don't know how I'm going to be able to process this. I don't know how I'm going to be able to get the positive result. Ask Allah. Everybody else is just a soldier of Allah. Allah controls them. Allah instills their ability. Allah instills, you know, the tawfiq in you and in them. Nothing can be done with except with the permission of Allah. First and foremost, because, he belong, because to him belongs the heavens, because to him belongs the earth, we must ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for um, our sustenance. And, the exclu and he also has the exclusive right to do what he wants. If somebody owns something, I can do what I want. This is my phone. You, know, you, you can't tell me what to do with my phone. I'll download whatever application I want. I'll download whatever MP3 that I want. I'll do whatever I want with this phone because it belongs to... Me. Similarly, if everything belongs to Allah, then Allah, it's His right to do what He wants, when He wants, how He wants. And for this, we must understand the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when He does something, He doesn't do it to hurt us, but He's doing it because it's in our best interest. And this is why when something bad happens, we don't go around and say, why, why, why? But we say, qadr Allah wa ma sha fa'al. This is the qadr of Allah, and He does what He wants, when He wants, how He wants, because it even belongs to Him. I should not question the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's move on. مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ So I believe we have about 15 minutes before the adhan. مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ The key word that I want to talk to you guys about today is shafa'ah. What is shafa'ah? Shafa'ah is intercession. What does intercession mean? 
Anybody. Okay. I'm going to give you guys the easiest example. What's your name? Samir? Samir. Huh? Samir. Samir. Tayyip. He wants to get married, inshallah ta'ala. We ask that Allah blesses you with a righteous wife, inshallah. But he wants to marry my daughter. This is a problem. So who comes in? Sedman. He says, Ali, listen, this guy, he's a very successful entrepreneur. He is very good Muslim. He donates, he gives zakat, he fears Allah, he prays. He comes, I see you every day in the masjid, Aslan. He comes to the masjid and he prays. So what is he doing for him? Shafa'ah. Tazkiyah. Huh? Tazkiyah. Right? So, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. مَنْ الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ There are two types of intercession. An intercession is mediating for someone else in order for them to gain benefit or to avoid harm. In order to gain benefit or to avoid harm. There are two types of intercession. There's the intercession between us in this worldly life and the intercession of the Akhirah. What I want to focus on today is the intercession of the Akhirah. The intercession of the Akhirah is broken down into two types and we need to understand this. The first type is intercession that is exclusive to who? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Only Muhammad sallallahu alayhi Wasallam. And from this intercession is what we call the greater intercession. Al-Maqam al-Mahmud. Now Al-Maqam al-Mahmud is the greatest intercession because it's not for one person. It's not for the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, But it is for all of humanity. It is for all of humanity. And it will happen on the day of judgment. On a day, يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِي وَأُمِّهِ أو يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِي وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِي وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِي لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مِنْهُمْ يَوْمَ إِنِنْ شَأْنٌ يُغْنِي Everyone will be dealing with themselves. Remember we said, everyone will be saying, help me, help me. Everyone will be saying what? Nafsi, nafsi. Right? The Prophet ﷺ narrates that people will be drowning in their sweat. Some people will be drowning up to their ankles, up to their waist. They will be drowning in their sweat because of the severity of that day, because the anxiety, because of the fear. And they know that they are standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everyone will be standing naked. To the point where Aisha said, everyone will be standing naked, Ya Rasulullah. Will that be distraction? Won't that be a distraction? He said, Al-Amru ashaddu min thalik. That the day on that day, the severity will be more than you could even imagine. And I never understood this hadith until I read an article. As you know, two years ago, there was a stampede that happened at Hajj. If you remember, there was a stampede and, and hundreds of people, uh, were, uh, were were killed. And I read an article of a person who managed to get out of that stampede. And he's writing in that article that when I was in that stampede, people's ihram, as you know, the ihram is only two pieces of cloth, right? And because of the heat, and because of the, you know, just being so tight and being so compressed, that people were taking off their ihram, and they were stuck and they couldn't move. This person was standing naked next to the next person and you're looking and that person is naked. But are you thinking to yourself, oh my God, this person is naked? No, that's the last thing that's coming in your mind. Rather what you're thinking is nafsi, nafsi. And at that moment when I read it, I said, Subhanallah, showing you how that day will actually be. You will not care about anyone except for yourself. But the Prophet is different. Every nation will go to their Prophet. 
Ask Allah to begin the day of judgment. Ask Allah to begin the day of judgment. Ask Allah to begin the day of judgment. I cannot, I cannot. I have sinned, I have fallen short. But when they go to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he will begin the day of judgment through the will of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. مَنَّ الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ عِنَّهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ Through the will of Allah. And Allah will inspire the Prophet and the Prophet will make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will begin the day of judgment. And everyone will be held accountable. 50,000 years, a day that is over 50,000 years. Subhanallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us refuge on a day. There's a, uh, a different type, and there are many different types of, of, uh, of intercession that the Prophet will offer. One of them is to the people of paradise. On the day of judgment or after everyone has been judged, then the Prophet will come to the gates of Jannah. And he will come to enter into the gates and an angel will say, Who are you? He will say, I am Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he will say, I have been ordered not to open these gates for anyone before you, Ya Muhammad. And Muhammad وسلم, will enter into the gates of paradise and his followers will then follow after. So it is Muhammad وسلم, that will begin the day of judgment through the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam that will be the first to enter into Jannah and have the gates open for every one of us bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. The second type of intercession is a general type of intercession. And that can be done by prophets, by messengers, by angels, and it can even be done by you and I, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Some of these uh, 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 examples are, the Prophet ﷺ said in an authentic hadith, uh, that there is no Muslim who dies and 40 men who do not associate partners with Allah, meaning that they are Muslims. Uh, pray the funeral prayer for him, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts their intercession for that person. There is another hadith where there will be people in Jannah, Ahlul Jannah, and they will be able to see the people of fire. And they will say, Ya Allah, this person is in the fire, but this person used to fast with us. This person used to pray with us. This person, even in the hadith, it says, used to make hajj with us. Nobody is safe. Nobody is safe. All these actions in the individual is still in the hellfire. What went wrong? Allah, please bring him out. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make the exception. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make the exception. Now some may ask, what about those who do not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Can we make shafa'a for them? We cannot, because one of the conditions of shafa'a, well, I'll just give you the three conditions of shafa'a. Number one is that Allah is pleased with the person who is making the shafa'a. Meaning the person who is asking Allah, Allah needs to be pleased with that individual. And some of the ahadith and the narrations have said that Allah will not give shafa'a to the person who curses a lot. He curses, he uses his tongue, and he's, he uses his tongue and, and verbally assaults other, and, 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 and puts out into the universe only horrible words. The individual who curses one another. So Allah needs to be happy with the person who is asking for the intercession or making the intercession. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must be also happy with the person who is being interceded for. Right? And in this, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, as Abu Huraira asked, who will be the one who receives your intercession on the day of judgment most? He said, those who make the statement of La ilaha illallah. And from this we have derived that that is the only way that some, uh, someone uh, can make shafa'a on our behalf. That we die by the statement of there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third condition is that we, or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives His Permission. Permission. Huh? So now we understand a little bit more 
about shafa'ah. We said that shafa'ah is of two types, the shafa'ah in the dunya, the shafa'ah in the akhirah, and we should said that the shafa'ah in the akhirah is broken down into two categories, that which is reserved for Muhammad Wasallam and that which is available for every one of us. Let's move forward. يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ And this verse, it is dealing with a specific subject. Does anybody know what that subject is? No? The yes. Yes. But more specific? Right. No? Yeah, yes. But I'm just looking for a specific answer. You're right, you're right, everybody's right, alhamdulillah. يَعْلَمُ الْعِلْمُ The knowledge. بإلى أن الله سبحانه وتعالى يعلم ما كان وما يكون وما لم يكون ولو كان كيف يكون that Allah knows what happened and what will happen Allah even knows what will not happen and if it were to happen He knows how it would happen this is just telling you the knowledge of Allah سبحانه وتعالى and again what is this showing us the difference between creation and Creator, because man only knows, well, he, he kind of remembers the past, right? I kind of remember, right? And we, we say we know what's going on around us, but we really don't know what's going on. And we have no idea what is happening in the, no idea what's happening tomorrow. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has perfect knowledge of what happened, of what is happening, and what will happen. He will know what will happen to us now while we are living in this dunya, whether we will be obedient, whether we will be disobedient, whether we will be good people, whether we will be evil people, whether we will try our best, or whether we will just be lazy. And he knows whether or not we will enter into paradise, and he knows whether or not we will enter into the hellfire. Something I want to shed some light on here is the knowledge of Allah. Sometimes people say to me, if Allah already knows that I'm going to the hellfire, then why do I need to even pray? Or why do I even need to, uh, uh, you know, be a good Muslim? The issue here is not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knowing where you will end up, does not, is not, there's no compulsion there. It does not, necess it does not necessitate that Allah is forcing you to go in that direction. It's just a matter of Allah knowing where you're going to be. It's not a matter of Allah forcing you because He's made this decision. You've made this decision. I've made this decision. But the thing is, Allah already knew the decision that we are going to make. So it doesn't go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it goes back to ourselves. He say, oh, why should I do this if it's already written because of this and because of that? That does not make sense. You don't know where you're going to end up. So don't make assumptions and live your life in a positive manner and hope and wish and earn the mercy and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. Just because He knows we're not Jabriya here. We're forced, we were forced to come here. Nobody was forced to come here today. But Allah knew that we were going to come here today. Nobody was forced. But Allah did know that we would be here today. Again, we're talking about knowledge here. And I want to go to the pronoun here. Ilmihi. And do they, they do not encompass... Nothing of his knowledge except what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. Meaning we will never earn, we will never understand anything, we will never be educated until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us this knowledge. Because Allah is Al-Alim, which means He is the source of all knowledge. Everything that we know is because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they have understood this in two different ways. Number one, ilmihi, the dhamir here, the ha, Ilmihi goes back to the knowledge of Allah. Meaning, knowing who Allah is, actually. Because we said Allah has more than 99 names. And we will never know these names unless He wills for us to know. So some of the scholars have said that this knowledge goes back to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the second interpretation of this verse is that it goes back to general knowledge. All knowledge. Scientific knowledge. 
any type of knowledge. That none of this can be attained except the will and the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have two verses left. We have two verses left. وَسِعَ كُرْسِيُّهُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَا يَؤُودُهُ حِفْظُهُمَا And we'll stop there. وَسِعَ كُرْسِيُّهُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ There's one word that I want to stop here and that is the word of what? Guess what? Kursi. This is why they call it Ayatul. You even wonder why? Why is it called Ayatul Kursi? Because the Kursi is actually mentioned in the verse. Now what does kursi mean? Okay, yes, so some buddies have been doing the research, mashallah. Okay, so, Bismillah. Bismillah. So kursi literally means the footstool. Literally means the footstool. And there have been other interpretations of this word kursi in this sequence, in this verse, where some have said it is the dominion. It is the kingdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His kingdom, you know, encompasses the heavens and the earth. And He needs no help in guarding and preserving them. Wasi'a kursihus, the dominion. There are other people who say that it is knowledge. That this kursi, it means knowledge. And this is one of the weaker interpretations because linguistically, that wouldn't make sense. And some of them have even said that kursi actually is Al Arsh. That kursi is another word for the Arsh. And what is the Arsh of Allah? The throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this, because it is Al Ghaybiyat, and this is a, a principle, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the world of the unseen, then we do not have the ability to come in and make our own ijtihad and say, well, it's this, or well, it's this, or well, it's that unless it is supported by Qur'an and Sunnah. And the Sunnah, the strongest opinion here, supports its literal meaning. Of what? Footstool. Of footstool. The Prophet ﷺ says, the seven heavens and the seven earths, in comparison to the kursi, to the kursi, not the arsh, but the kursi, are nothing but like a ring that is thrown into the desert. So the heavens and the earth and everything in comparison to the kursi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is nothing in comparison. The comparison is like a ring. A ring that you throw into the middle of a huge desert. So you can actually see the, 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 the magnitude of this creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he goes on to say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and such is the case with the kursi in respect to the Arsh, in respect to the Arsh, show, even showing you the greatest of creations, which is the Arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Last but not least are the, is the final uh, sentence here of the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ Now let's take two minutes to understand these two Names. That he does not need any help in guarding and preserving them. Allahu Samad. We need help. We need assistance. Again, we're going back to the separation between creation and creator. We always call, can you help me out? I'm moving. Can you help me out? Allah does not need help. He can maintain and sustain his creation because he is Al Qayyum. Again, going back to the first name that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, or one of the first names Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the first uh, portion of the ayah. Al Aliyun Al Ulu Al Ulu Al Ulu. I'm trying to look for the youngest person. And I've done this before, but I will do it again because it is only suitable. This young man right here. Come here. Yes. Yes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay. I have a question for you. Okay. Okay? All right. My question to you is this. 
Where is Allah? Where is Allah? You can even just point if you want. Where is Allah? Go sit down. You've done a, well, well, a fine job raising your son. Fitra. This is what we call fitra. Do you guys know what fitra is? Natural disposition. I was going, Ya Allah, let him say up, Ya Allah. Wow, we got it, mashallah. Up. Allah is? Huh? He did the exact same thing that the woman slave, huh? She uh, uh, did for the Prophet. When she was a slave, the Prophet ﷺ asked, Where is Allah? And she pointed to the sky, as our young scholar has pointed. And, subhanAllah. And he said, Indeed, she is a believe her, so free her. So free her. So she was freed because of her belief in Allah subhanAllah. Huwa al-Aliyul Azim. Meaning he is above all of his creation and all of his creation is below him. And all of his creation is below him. Al-Azim. Al-Azim meaning what? The greatest. What does this name do for me? What does this name do for you? It puts priority in our lives. It puts priority in our lives. That regardless of what you're doing, when you're doing, or who you're doing it for, when a time comes to fulfill your responsibility to Allah, know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al azim And He is greater than any responsibility or any job that we have in this dunya. So we must uphold that greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and show Him that He is great. He doesn't need us to show Him. But to show Him, that we understand and that we know and we recognize His greatness through our submission and putting Him before everything and everything. Anything and everything. The Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our priority. That being said, Alhamdulillah, we have completed our short explanation of Ayatul Kursi. I hope and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the tawfiq and the ability to learn this verse, to recite it, to understand it, to memorize it, and to apply it in our everyday lives. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfir Allah li wa lakum fa astaghfiru innahu huwa al-ghafoor al-rahim. Jazakum Allah khairan.